So I just want to start with the proposition or start discussing why we're, why we're doing this work. And my talk's going to be a, li a little bit different than the other ones in terms of having a launch um, co-op. It's more about the partnership that we're building and the type of, um, that we're building with labor to, to scale new platform cooperatives. And then Rhea's going to talk about a concrete example of that happening. Um, so I want to start off with why we're, why we're doing this work. We feel very deeply at the ICA group that home care should be, whoa, just says both. Okay, home child care. <laughs> um, so that home care should be dignified work um, and that child care should be dignified work and, and my slides aren't working. So why are, the, why are the people taking care of our loved ones living in poverty right now? And that's the question that I feel like, you know, it, it's such an obvious thing that people who care for the people who we care about, they should have dignified valued jobs. And for some reason that has not borne out in our society. Right now it's, it's 95.6, let's look at childcare. It's over 95% women. It's disproportionately people of color. It's, they get an average of $10 an hour, $10 and 30 cents an hour. That's 25% below what other people with similar backgrounds get, right? So with, people with similar demographics get 25% lower than they get 25% lower than the people who are taking care of our of our family members only 9.6 have health insurance um, a seventh of of child care workers below live below the poverty line and they can't afford care to take care of their own children right so this is this is the this is the issue that we're grappling with um, and one more statistic 90% of them can't meet their one person local budget like they can't, they're going into debt. This is, that, that's the reality of people who are taking care of our, of our children. Um, and at the same time, we've heard it from other people on the panel, there's other people on the panel with children. I, we can't figure out how to get childcare. <laughs> like we can't figure out how to get child, you know, like my, uh, in my personal life, my husband decided to stay home because we we're looking at the different options that we have. And if we wanted to pay in line with our values, we would be paying more than he was making, right? So that's, that's the reality that we're living in, is this is an industry that's completely ripe for transformative change. And I think that um, not only is the current model broken, but there's space for innovation, because the people who have the largest market share in childcare, they only hold a fraction of the market right now, right? So there's room for us to innovate. There's room for us to get in, into this market. Um, and it's not an industry that's worth it so far from what we've seen from VCs. And we wanted to start getting into this market before we anticipated there would be a whole lot of federal funding for childcare coming through. And so we wanted to get in early. Um, <laughs> so now that um, we have a slightly different political um, landscape, it's even more important that we, that we work hard to push for the standards in these industries. So why is platform cooperativism the most important part of the solution, it's because it's this, in, like, it, it gets me just excited to think about, like, oh, it's a perfect fit. It aggregates all of the independent providers. Um, it can bring people out of the gray market. It can give people access to, to uh, stronger business models through providing shared services, back office support, joint marketing, all of the things that we need. It's like, oh, this is, this is the model that we need. And so how do, we, how do we enact this? We, we need a deep partnership um, that, that pulls the different pieces of the ecosystem together, right? So the ICA group, um, I'm the associate, my name's Camille. <laughs> it's nice to meet you all. <laughs> Don't think I mentioned that. I'm from the ICA group, I'm the associate director there. We've been, we're the oldest, uh, Nonprofit in the U.S. dedicated to worker ownership and worker cooperative development. We're a consulting firm. We were lawyers. Um, we're finance geeks. We're people who um, we've drawn some people from private equity that want to find purpose in their lives. We've done a whole lot of different things 
to get the capacity that we need to the cooperative, the, the business capacity that, that other sectors have, that other worlds have, and bring it into the cooperative economy, right? So that's who we are. We're doing business consulting um, and, and governance design and uh, democratic design. We do that business side of it, but we can't do all of it alone. We work with, we need deep community partners, right? Like we need people making beautiful, um, beautiful, um, um, what are you doing? <laughs> bandits. We need beautiful bandits. We need people that can communicate with it. That's not our strength is, is reaching and organizing community members, right? Um, we don't, we don't shake our booties very often at the ICA group. That is not one of our core strengths. So we need community partners and policy partners and people who can, who can change the, because not only do we need to organize people, but we need to raise the standards and government is an, an important player in making sure that these are dignified industries, right? We need reimbursement rates to be up higher and we can't do that through a, through a business model, right? We have to do that through, through policy. We have to do that through change at the government level. And then we need our workers because they're going, their, their work is to make us obsolete in this, right? We start out here and we push for, um, you know, we help drive the business model, we do the market studies, we figure out the governance model that'll be both flexible, but also have, you know, genuine democratic control. And they, and they help design all that alongside us and then they make us completely obsolete in the process by taking over that business and running it themselves, right? So this is the partnership that we're looking to create here in multiple in multiple different places is is deep community partners us is driving the initial business and the workers eventually um, continuing that partnership with labor and maybe with us on training but um, but running these businesses by themselves so what does and I'm look, I'm going to talk about the child care side of it um, because Ria is going to go more in depth on the on um, the LVNs and home health work but on child care, you know, availability info for parents, you know, quality control, and on the other side, joint marketing, access to subsidy programs, tax support, automated billing, all of these things together can create both a, a better consumer experience and a better worker experience. And, and what we found is that in these industries, and in caregiving especially, treating workers well, creating secure jobs, where they can go to the same place every single day, that means better care, right? So this is how we make the industry better from a consumer perspective as well. We have to create secure economic, like child care centers are closing across the country and new ones popping up, but they're closing across the country because it's a really insecure business and people who wanna watch children don't wanna administer a business. You don't go into childcare because you like filling out forms. You go into childcare because you love children, right? So what we can do is take some of that burden um, and, and turn it into back office support. So we're hoping, given the fact that there's very few large players in the market and that they only have a fraction of it, that we can work with these community partners to create a, um, a both a um, app that, in, that aggregates um, family child care providers, independent family child care providers and centers and create a better model for child centers because those are closing as well. And um, so 10,000 center employees and 30,000 independent providers is our three to five year goal. And we're hoping to work with SEIU um, very deeply to do that. We're working in Chicago um, with uh, HCII and then we're, we're working with United um, Healthcare Workers West. They do the training and they help, and we help, uh, they do the training and, and reach out to their members and we build these businesses alongside the workers. So we're really excited about this process. Uh, we've done a lot of market research already. Um, we've defined what the, helped define what the union role in the work is around training and, and long-term participation. And um, we're a little farther along on the LVNs than on the childcare. We've, we've done a whole lot of um, lists of possible um, features for the childcare and it's gonna go through the same process they went through where everything, all of that gets thrown out and we start from scratch, but at least we have like a list to start throwing out, right? And, um, <laughs> and then, it, um, but the public launch is a lot more imminent with these LVNs. So um, I'm gonna hand it over to Ria to talk about what the real experience of being a cooperator is in one of these, these co-ops. So 
Thanks, you guys. There you go. This is how you want to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, how do I go to the next? You just you just uh, click on that. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ria Lancaster. <clears throat> I work as a licensed vocational nurse since 2004, and I would like to talk about an exciting program um, created by LVNs for LVNs. It's called the LVN Co-op. The idea for the LVN Co-op, um, also known as Nursing and Caregivers Cooperative evolved last year when five of the board members who are all LVNs um, experienced major changes in the workforce. We are slowly but um, surely being pushed out of our current working environment. Um, the co-op was developed in response to the increasing use of on-demand labor, especially in the healthcare setting, as well as lack of employment opportunities um, for LVNs inside hospital walls. Our mission is to provide um, high quality, convenient healthcare on-demand to increase access to care, and to grow the LVN profession by providing employment opportunities for highly trained LVNs. In response to the diminishing role of LVNs in the hospital environment, we have created um, eLVNs, like Uber nurses, but better. <laughs> Here's how it works. LVNs are recruited to the co-op and go through interviews and trainings. Then, when a patient needs medical care in their home, they use an app just like they would uh, when calling for an Uber to take them somewhere. LVNs who are close by then respond to the call and visit the patients in their homes. We want to make sure the nurses have great wages. That's why the LVNs have chosen to be a member of the union. Uh, we have partnered up with SEIU UHW or its um, Service Employees International Union, United Healthcare Worker West. LVNs get the good benefits and uh, wages that we need we get the flexibility to work when we want. Patients get highly care, um, quality, high quality care in their homes and the union grows as the co-op gets bigger and bigger. The union role has been valued in part because they bring relationships with employers to whom we can make a solid business um, case for why they should use the LVN co-op. We believe we can reduce emergency room admissions and improve clinical outcomes as well as provide healthcare consumers with a novel, easy and cost-effective way of receiving needed care. We believe this model could materially lower the cost of healthcare for Californians and save the hospital industry serious money. Many of the gains will come by centralizing employees uh, benefits in the co-op and simplifying key labor functions. We finally launched our first pilot project in August, working with our healthcare partner it's a federally qualified health clinic called St. John's Well Child and Family Center in South LA, helping medical moms get access to pre and postnatal care in the convenience of their own home under the supervision of a medical doctor. Medical moms are supposed to get 12 visits during their pregnancy, and oftentimes they miss their follow up visits due to transportation issues, childcare issues, um, or lack of time going to the clinics. We also encourage follow-up uh, visits uh, with the doctor to make sure they deliver a healthy and happy baby. Currently, uh, we're scheduling LVNs by coordinating with uh, St. John's scheduling team and myself. I'm basically the app right now. <laughs> so there are about um, 20 bilingual English, Spanish speaking LVNs member of the co-op who are working and taking appointments. Uh, the pilot project started in August, um, and we will have uh, we have completed about 100 home visits so far. We have seen the no-show rate from the patient drop from 50% when patients have to come to the clinic, um, down to 30% when they are seen at their homes. We hired an um, app developer who have created an app for the co-op, which was completed about a month ago on October 12. But the but the co-op will own the app and the app is called Nurses Can. So that's the um, Nurses Can app. We are in the process of testing out the new app and giving feedbacks on the user experience. Each of us are testing different roles. For example, um, I would be the administrative role and I would create a new partnership, such as like clinics, hospital, create coordinators and nurses, um, then test out for each role 
if we can set up appointments, accepting appointments, and test out also other features in the app. Um, this is the nurses app homepage, the nurses can homepage. It's uh, very simple, straightforward, and very user-friendly. The modules are created for nurses, partners, patients, and also appointments. The next slide is the appointment module, where um, this is meant for, for us also to see the, what appointments are available. You can see the patients, uh, what time is their appointment on date, um, who the partner is. Currently, right now, we're just working with one partner, which is St. John's Well Child and Health Clinic. But um, you know, if we expand, there, there will be different partners in that section. Um, there's also different candidates. Under candidates, that means like, for example, for that one particular appointment, three nurses are interested. So basically, the nurses will um, apply, I guess you can say, uh, for that particular appointment. And whoever, and then later on, um, under the nurses, that would be the assigned nurses. So from the three uh, nurses, then we would give it to one of the nurses. <clears throat> and also, um, this is the patient modules. The app developer have created also some improvement um, for this app to be more user-friendly. Um, so the patient, this is, uh, we haven't had have the patient interaction yet at this point where we give the app to the patient. It's still like web-based and then we still have to launch the app live. Um, but pretty much it will be like the patient will be able to see the patient's name um, and also uh, it will have the gender, the phone number, what language do they speak, and also which, uh, what clinics their, their appointment's at. Notifications are not present as timeline in the dashboard modules. Easy to understand format for date and time is being used throughout the application. So for example, we will be using things like the appointment was, was one hour ago, it was yesterday, last week, instead of um, having a date like October 9, 2016. And we will also be using color codes to use uh, to improve intuitiveness. For example, blue notification represent it's a, a new appointment, have not been interacted with. Pending is yellow, and if the appointment is taken, um, it, will be, it will turn into green. Um, and also for the nurses end, uh, it was more like a kinder approach of notifying the nurses of last appointments, meaning the appointment is given to other nurses. Um, so it will use gray background for notification box and rewarding um, of the notification announcement messaging. So for example, on the gray, it will say, uh, this appointment is no longer available. And there's also, uh, for the, under the appointment modules, there's comprehensive view of appointment details for nurses, so they can decide whether or not to apply. The screenshot below shows the appointment view um, of the pending status. Coordinators also get a better view of the appointment and candidate's information. Once uh, d a decision is to be made, they can now choose a nurse by clicking on an assign button. This leaves no confusion about the action and to make the application flow easier to follow. All views are now dynamic and adjust to the current state of the application. Below is the appointment view after the appointment was awarded. The list of candidates is replaced with the nurses selected. The view will also adjust for nurses and the admin roles. Missing data in the view is handled with default values. For example, the address is not provided. It will actually say address not provided instead of just leaving the, um, leaving in the box blank. This enhances how the user feel about the application when it comes to addressing um, concerns of why, they are, why there are empty spaces. Notifications for awarded appointments allow nurses to edit or new, also enhance the colored border to attract um, attention. All notifications can now be dismissed, similar to mark as read. Um, the application allows nurses to access the appointment edit form to enter the duration of the visit and mark it complete. <clears throat> so um, hopefully these um, images were, uh, provides a better understanding of the Nurses Can app. It's not live yet, but it will be soon. Uh, we can't wait to launch this app, uh, which we will believe will streamline the scheduling process and will connect the patients to the LVN on the field better. 
So it's been an exciting and uh, but challenging ride to build something definitely from the ground up, but I can't wait to see where we are going and what we can accomplish together partnering up with the, with the union. Finally, I'd like to say that um, I'm really happy to be able to work alongside with the union that has the creativity and the guts to make this a reality and the integrity and trust to encourage LVNs like, um, like us to put it together and run it. Um, it's why I feel so positive about the future of um, the LVN profession and also the future of the union, SEIU UHW. Thank you so much for giving opportunity to speak about Nurses Scan. Okay, so we have a few minutes left after these like very sort of invigorating uh, presentations. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, coffee and uh, some, uh, you know, pastries, I hope. Um, and uh, so, in between you and the pastries, uh, what, are the, uh, <laughs> what are the questions? Do you have questions? Uh, shoot away. I feel several uh, folks talked for you, sort of one foot on the street, one foot in the cloud, or offline to online organizing. And I'm curious, especially with um, the Cooperify model as well as Lokonomics, as you're looking at these service um, event-based apps to a certain degree, if there's thought to, to um, I guess, getting people onto those platforms if you would host like community events or something like that, especially in the Lokonomics presentation, I felt like I saw that you said people could kind of book events through your platform. So as we deal with the uh, the net article capitalism of Facebook and these others, other providers uh, interested to know if that kind of uh, community organizing plays into the, the service apps that you're looking at. And you can... um, so definitely there needs to be an offline element and I think like Coopify them already having worker on cooperatives, they have that community. And since we're targeting more of an independent service professional, uh, it's a community that they don't currently have, but they, they definitely yearn for one. That's from our research. Um, we had one actually just last Saturday. And, you know, seeing like landscapers, cleaning professionals, um, dog walkers, and Reiki professionals, like, you know, just having community is it was something that I think pretty special um, and that definitely needs to be a, a focus because um, I, I think that's what's going to really bring you know the digital part um, into real life it's it's the people right and um, providing those opportunities is one of I guess our main focuses over the next few months I was going I was going to say in the Transmedia world, um, which is one of my homes where I come from, um, uh, like I look at how and when <clears throat> people engage uh, or um, engage with an interactive proje uh, project. Um, and the way that we think about it is through event-driven engagement, um, which is all the more critical with uh, folks who are traditionally under-resourced or on the other side of the digital divide traditionally. Um, the, so create, as in, as you're intuiting, um, someone's, it's less frequent than someone is looking for an app and also, or, you know, their level of digital literacy might be lower or different, you know, it's a different kind of literacy. And so it's a really high touch, um, engagement. Uh, we found when we created the interactive audio novella app that we, um, for almost every single person who subscribed to it, we had to walk them through it, or we did it in large assemblies. Say, you know, if you are, if you think that becoming part of this, if you think this movement is really strong, um, hold up your phone. If you think it's really important to be engaged digitally, keep your phone phone up and call this number right now, and um, you know, add it to your contact list. So it's like it's just slightly tweaked um, and more user testing because you can't assume, or you know, it kind of undermines it. This fallacy or points out the fallacy about um, that we're ubi of be ubiquitous computing that we're all going to download apps. This may not have been direct to your question, but in the green taxi uh, example, um, they turned out over a hundred of their members for the legislative hearing 
and then around 50 of their members packed the PUC chamber that was issuing its decision. And this is, this is, these, are, these are the annals of regulatory policy where nobody but lawyers and energy wonks generally go to listen. And they filled the room, a sea of, of first and second generation immigrants. And the commissioners acknowledged their presence on live stream in an archived audio recording um, that these are folks who showed up. And it was really powerful. It made a difference. Um, and they acknowledged and thanked them for their participation in a setting that is reserved for very, very few uh, followers in any other context. So I think the online capacity to mobilize, activate, and organize is a real complement to you know, the heritage of, of, of unions activating their members in a, in a more kind of offline setting. This is, is this on? Yeah, um, this isn't necessarily a direct answer to your question, but um, with Coopify, there's a lot of potential value propositions. We're starting with, you know, the client facing and like just bringing more clients to the co-ops. We know the co-ops are great, um, and we know that they need more clients. So that's that's what our initial focus is. You know, we've been thinking, and like as this develops, I think the next stage is the building out of the back office function um, and like kind of streamlining things, but it's very important. Like right now the co-ops have a system and have a back office system that works offline and it works great. It works partially online and partially offline, but it, like you can be a co-op member who doesn't have a printer and doesn't have internet and doesn't have a phone and doesn't have anything and you can go into the office, pick up your contracts, figure out where your jobs are like, and that works and we do not want to mess with that. Um, you know, so I think it's about seeing what parts of it are like, yes, this needs digitizing, this needs to connect to a bigger world, and what parts of it are like people who are on the other side, I love that phrase, on the other side of the digital divide, have systems, their systems work, they don't need to be messed with necessarily. Like, starting there. bootstrapping that's going on, limited resources, and it's just absolutely amazing. But there's this legacy co-op sector that's out there, and they have enormous uh, capacity to build into this. The utility co-ops have, have two IT co-ops that service things for smart energy, smart grid, mass mailing, all this kind of stuff. Has there been any conversation with any of these legacy co-ops out there toward building greater capacity with our platform co -op? And if not, why not? And if yes, then where are we at? Uh, well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I can, we spoke about this before, Keith, right? Like, I, and Nathan and I certainly spoke about this. It's a problem, right? So, I mean, I don't want to be dramatic about it, but uh, I mean, there are many non return phone calls and uh, or what I often got is like, yeah, you know, uh, go to Baltimore and you will meet these two men in this back alley. And if they like you, they will introduce you to the co-op bosses. You know? And it's like, so not just one, but several. So I don't want to generalize this, but uh, uh, this was certainly my experience. I think it's a problem because I think there's not a clear understanding. Maybe, you know what, for them, this, the model works. It works. 